Hey everybody, welcome back to another Foundations in Faith as we continue looking at those foundational beliefs of Christianity and Lutheranism. Uh, just a quick review, we had been walking through the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, the Augsburg Confession itself, the Catechisms, um, but as I said in the last video, the, the beliefs and the controversies around communion really weren't that extensive in the time of Luther, at the time the Catechism and the Confessions were written. So we haven't really been diving into those too much last week and this week, um, but we will get back into them next week as we move into our topic. But for today, I just want to continue that topic of uh, communion, the Lord's Supper, what it is, uh, how, how things happen within it, and the different controversies surrounding it. Last week, we gave you a, a pretty big overview. I guess that was two weeks ago, and I have to apologize. I took a little staycation with the family last week, um, so that's why a video didn't come out. But we are back this week. So two weeks ago... Uh, we did an overview of communion, what it is, kind of what the general beliefs are. This week, I want to cover the two kind of most frequently asked questions, if you want to put it that way. I actually have the, the document in front of me titled Communion FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions. Um, and I was talking to Vicar about this just a minute ago, about the different controversies surrounding communion. What would you talk about if you had to talk about the sticking points of communion? And he came up with these two things. They're the two things that I came up with, with before talking to him. Um, so we're going to dive into these two. We'll see how long it takes. And next week we'll dive into confession and repentance, which was a big controversy. We'll, we'll be uh, very well back into the Augsburg Confession next week. So for this week, as we look at communion, the two main controversies that we came up with for communion are what are the differences in communion beliefs, meaning what are the differences in how exactly it happens, what exactly is happening in communion, and what do we believe as Lutherans, and then the second one would be, why do some churches not allow everyone to take communion? Same as we do here. We do not allow anyone uh, to come in off the streets that we don't know and take communion with us for an extended amount of time. So we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But the first topic, um, the differences in communion beliefs. And I think I spoke about this about two weeks ago, um, but we'll cover them again really quickly here. That there are three different beliefs, mainly three beliefs, on what's happening within communion. These are kind of founded actually in Platonic philosophy. Uh, so there's a lot going on behind the scenes having to do with the true substance of things and forms and accidents. Um, accidents meaning physical manifestation here in the world. You don't really need to know all of that. If you're interested, you can email me. We can talk about it. Um, but for our purposes, for kind of a, a foundational belief, a ground level belief, there's three different views. The first one is transubstantiation. And this is kind of what the Catholic Church believes, teaches, and confesses. And this means that the elements, the bread and the wine, are actually physically changed into flesh and blood. Now, it's a little bit sticky, um, because how can we say that? Because when you eat it and when you drink it, it still tastes like bread and wine. And they would say, no, 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 there's actually not bread and wine present anymore, that the power of God has transformed them into Christ's body and blood. The bread and the wine cease to exist in this view in transubstantiation and are replaced completely and entirely by the body and blood of Christ. So it's kind of the Catholic view that's a, a very, very um, high church view, if you want to put it that way, kind of very traditional view of what's going on in communion. That is not what we believe as Lutherans. Um, so I'm going to hold that to the last, what we believe as Lutherans. The third view usually that people talk about is kind of a, a spiritual view of communion, or a remembrance view is another way to put it. This would say that there is no physical flesh and blood of Christ. The flesh and blood of Jesus Christ are not present within communion, but that it's just a spiritual remembrance or a, a spiritual symbology that's happening there. Um, so this helps us think about the sacrifice of Christ. This helps us think about the cross and what he's done for us. But there's not actually any real presence of Christ within communion. So we have kind of the two ends of the spectrum, one being that the bread and the wine cease to exist altogether, the other being that all that's there is bread and wine. The third one that Lutherans believe is kind of right in the middle, and uh, this is another really good Lutheran tension. We don't understand how it happens, and I don't think we're meant to. We're not meant to understand because it takes faith for communion. We'll talk about that in just a second as we get into the second point, but uh, just to cover our bases here, the second view, the kind of that middle view that Lutherans believe, that we believe, is called consubstantiation. So remember the Catholic view was transubstantiation. This is consubstantiation. 
meaning that the bread and the wine and the body and the blood exist together in communion. That in some way, as the words are spoken over communion, as the power of God comes on the bread and the wine, the bread and the wine don't cease to exist, but the body and blood of Jesus Christ are joined to the bread and the wine. And the way we talk about this, the way Luther talks about it within the catechisms, is to say that Christ is present in, with, under, alongside, around, all those different prepositions, uh, the bread and the wine. So the bread and the wine are still there. That's why when you, when you eat it, when you drink it, it tastes like bread and wine. And yet God has promised, Christ has promised, that he is present within the bread and the wine. That his body and his blood are there, and that as we eat them and drink them, we are receiving the forgiveness of sins through his body and blood and through the bread and the wine. So hopefully that clears it up a little bit. Those are kind of the three main views. As I said, the Lutheran view is consubstantiation, or more often than not, that's kind of a big word, and it's confusing if you don't have the background of it. We just say real presence. The real presence of Christ is here in the bread and the wine, alongside, again, in, with, under, around, however you want to say it. Um, Christ is physically present, and yet so are the bread and the wine. They don't cease to exist. So the second point, the first one was kind of easy, that's just laying out different um, doctrines and theologies. The second point is a little more touchy. Why do some churches, why does St. Paul not allow everyone to take communion? Why do we not allow everybody who comes in to just take communion without talking to them, without hearing what they believe? Um, and a lot of people see this as exclusive. A lot of people say, oh, the church is just a good old boys club, and you've got to be in to be able to do everything in the service, and you've got to have that membership card to take communion and come up to the front. Um, that's really not the case. Yes, we want you to be members to take communion with us. Yes, we want you to be part of the Lutheran church to take communion with us, but it's not so that we can be exclusive. It's not so that we can keep people out. Rather, it's out of Christian love that we ask people not to come to communion. This is a, it's a really strong point, and I can't hit this point enough. It's not to exclude, but rather to protect people, to care for people, um, to care for their spiritual well-being. Uh, the reason for this is that the misuse of the Lord's Supper, taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, has pretty big consequences, and Scripture speaks this way. Okay, This isn't just Pastor Steve or Pastor Andrew or Vicar saying, no, 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 we don't want you at the rail. Scripture warns about the use of communion and the improper use of communion. So I want to turn there with you, if you will. Um, if you have your Bible alongside you, you can open it up. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. A little bit of background. Corinthian church uh, is one that Paul founded. Uh, Paul went into the city of Corinth, established the church there. He went away for a while. And while he was gone, they, had, they developed some practices that he needed to address. And so 1 Corinthians is a pretty harsh letter within the New Testament. Um, Paul is kind of coming down on him and saying, you guys need to shape up. You need to get your act together. You're not acting in the way that Christians should be acting. One of the things he calls them to task on is their communion practices. They were not practicing communion in a good manner, in the way in which it was instituted. Um, so this is what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 11. We're in verse 17 here. I'm going to read with you. You can follow along. He writes to the Corinthians, In the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. So right off the bat, he's coming at him. He's saying, your meetings where you're having communion, your worship meetings where you're worshiping and having communion, they're doing more harm than good. So right off the bat, we know something is wrong in what they're doing. He says, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. To some extent, I believe it. No, no doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you has God's approval. He's a little bit sarcastic there. Um, he's coming down on divisions in the church. He addresses them earlier in the letter. I don't want to dive too deeply into that now because it's not. it doesn't really have to do with communion. Um, but there should not be divisions in the church is what Paul is saying there. Um, and then secondly, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 20, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. So they thought they were having communion. They thought they were practicing in the way they should be practicing, that they were taking the Lord's Supper. But he says, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. 
So as we come together for communion in St. Paul, it's not that we're coming at different times and someone gets a whole bunch and is eating his fill and getting drunk on the wine and somebody else has nothing. No, we're very careful to um, distribute the, the elements in a way that is beneficial, in a way that isn't going to get somebody um, in trouble in that way. But that's what the Corinthian church was doing. They were coming together and having these big meals, which was pretty common in the um, New Testament era and early Christian church. They would have a giant meal surrounding communion instead of just part of the worship service. But part of that was the, the wealthy, the people who didn't have to work, would come in, they would eat all the food, they would eat all the bread, they would drink all the wine, they would actually get drunk on communion wine. And then the people who had to work would come in later in the day, there would be nothing left for them. There would be no communion left for them. Um, and so, yes, that in and of itself is a problem. But Paul's bigger problem here is you're misusing the Lord's Supper. You're not treating the Lord's Supper the way it should be treated. Um, and because you're doing that, you're not actually taking the Lord's Supper. You're defiling it. You're taking something else. So in the face of all these things that are going wrong in the Corinth practice of communion, he wants to give them kind of the basis, the foundation, <laughs> again, of what communion is. So he says to them, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So he gives them right there the foundation of communion. What is it we believe in communion? Jesus instituted communion. He took the bread, said, this is my body. He took the cup, said, this is my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you eat of it, as often as you drink of it, in remembrance of me. So right there, the basis of communion. And then that little line, verse 26, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's going to be important in just a minute, so keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to swing back around and talk about that, but I want to dive into um, verses 27 and following, because this talks about the misuse of the Lord's Supper and why we ask people to be members of the Lutheran Church before they come to communion. So verse 27, he says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. And it doesn't get any more harsh or really any scarier um, for anyone, if you think about it. If you don't take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner, you're sinning against Jesus himself as you misuse his body and his blood. He says, how do we take communion in a worthy manner? Paul tells us, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So Paul sees the real presence of Christ within communion. If you don't recognize the body of the Lord is here, you don't have a proper understanding of communion. Um, and so you're, you're eating and drinking judgment upon yourself. More than that, he says, that's why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. So not only does it have spiritual consequences when you misuse the Lord's Supper, it actually has physical consequences, uh, at least in Corinth, and we can assume it does uh, continuing on even to today. When you misuse the Lord's Supper, when you eat or drink in an unworthy manner, it has very real consequences in your life. Paul says some people have died, um, fallen asleep, another way of saying died, because they misused the Lord's Supper. And he says, uh, but if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we're judged by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So kind of the two parts of what does it mean to take communion in a worthy manner that Paul's, Paul lays out here in the, in the few verses that we looked at. First is to discern the body and the blood of the Lord. Again, Paul sees very clearly the real presence, the body and blood of Jesus Christ in communion. So we have to discern that Jesus is present in communion. Uh, the second is kind of that last little bit that we read. We need to judge ourselves. We need to examine ourselves, our own unworthiness. We need to recognize the sin in our lives, recognize our need for forgiveness, and then be willing to receive that forgiveness, knowing that it's not from us. It's nothing that we can do to earn that forgiveness. Rather, it's a free gift of God. It's the free gift that he gives us within communion, that forgiveness that he tells us about 
again. So those are the two things. The real presence of Christ, his body and his blood in communion. And then the necessity of communion. That we need this forgiveness. Um, that it's nothing that we can do. That we are sinful. Uh, that we need Jesus to come in and forgive us in that way. So those are the two things that are um, necessary to eat and drink communion in a worthy manner. Those are the scriptural things. The next one is kind of a church practice thing. And this gets a little bit back to um, verse 26. Which says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim what has happened in the history of the church, in the history of Jesus' life, in the history of this church that you are now communing with. So as we, we draw that and extend it into the teachings of the church to proclaim that this church has the correct proclamation about Jesus to take communion with them, is saying you agree with the proclamation of this church. But you can't agree with the proclamation of a church in just one aspect. When you, when you publicly go forward and say you agree with the proclamation of this church, you're saying their entire dogma, their entire teaching, everything we've been talking about in Foundations of Faith, everything we'll be talking about, everything they believe teaching them best, you believe as well. That's what you're saying when you go up to the communion rail at a church. And so another reason that we sometimes ask people not to take communion at one of our churches um, is because they come from a different background. They come from a different theological body. They come from a different Christian body that doesn't believe the same as we do as Lutherans. So it may not be that they're eating and drinking judgment on themselves. They may discern the body of Christ. They may realize they need forgiveness. Um, and yet in different teachings of the church, we differ from their denomination. We would say that's confusing people. That places a stumbling block in front of people uh, to say, why can't, um, let me pick a denomination, why can't Methodists come in and just be part of our church and take communion with us and then go worship in the Methodist church too. Uh, and that's kind of dividing the teachings or muddying the teachings. Um, and so I, I know Paul talks about we shouldn't have divisions. We shouldn't be doing things separately in the body of Christ. And yet we want to have a clear proclamation of what it is we believe, teach, and confess. And as Lutherans, we believe, teach, and confess that everything we have is straight from Scripture. Uh, that it's very clear within Scripture what we believe, teach, and confess. So we want to stay as close to that as we can. So it's not, again, it's not a hateful thing. It's not an exclusive thing. It's not to throw up divisions. Rather, it's to first remove that condemnation that can come through the misuse of communion. Well, those first two points we've talked about. It's to protect people from taking communion in an unworthy manner. Uh, but then second, it's also to keep our testament clear, our testimony clear, as well as to help keep the testimony of the person coming to communion clear so that we know what we each believe um, and confess um, so that we can keep those lines and remove stumbling blocks. That's the big thing. Because if you're coming to a church, if you're coming to a Lutheran church, and you know um, Sally Jo goes to a Methodist church and yet comes to communion at St. Paul, you might say, well, we're not different. I can go worship over there. Now you're muddying those waters. Now you're kind of saying, I believe what both of these churches confess and teach, and yet we don't confess and teach the same thing. Um, so it can lead to doubts. It can lead to struggles in faith when there don't need to be any um, extra struggles of faith there. Uh, so in that way, we do ask that people be part of the LCMS, part of the Lutheran Church, in order to come to communion. So there's kind of three different practices in how that plays out within the world. The first would be kind of open communion. Um, you've heard about this. You see this all the time in kind of the Joel Osteen churches, the non-denominational churches, the Bible churches, things like that, um, where they play music in the background. They just have communion stations, usually. Um, they say, during the song, if you want to get up and take communion, go ahead. We're not going to have someone there distributing whatever, um, something of that nature. Anyone that wants to can come and take communion. That's open communion. Uh, that is not what we practice. But the second, uh, I guess we'll treat this a little bit like the uh, different thoughts at the beginning. There's three of them. We'll, go, we'll jump to the third. The third one is closed communion, C-L-O-S-E-D communion. Uh, this would say that only members of this church can take communion here. Only members of St. Paul can take communion at St. Paul. So if you come from Epiphany, Lutheran, Lake Worth, down to St. Paul, we would ask that you not take communion. That's closed communion. That is also not what we practice here at St. Paul. Let me be very clear, we do not practice that. My grandparents live in Fort Myers uh, across the alley. They come over and they take communion when they visit. They're not members of St. Paul. They're members of a different Lutheran church over in uh, Fort Myers, and yet we welcome them here. So what we would say, um, and it's, it's a little bit like splitting hairs, we would say it's close communion. 
communion, C-L-O-S-E communion. So saying that churches that we are in altar pulpit fellowship with, churches that we align in doctrine, teaching, and practice with, like other LCMS Lutheran churches, um, their members are also welcome to come commune here. This means that I can go to my, um, my in-laws church down in Texas, take communion there. This means they can come here and take communion here. So it's kind of a, a little more open than closed, and yet a little more closed than open. It's kind of a middle way, again, for the Lutheran church. So hopefully that didn't cause more questions than give you answers. It might have. That's okay. Um, I'm always here. If you want to continue the conversation, you can email me, uh, Pastor Andrew at S-T-P-A-U-L-B-O-C-A dot com. I would love to email you and talk in that way. You can also leave a comment under this YouTube video and reach out in that way. As I said, we are going to confession and repentance next week. We'll be back in the Augsburg Confession, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. Until then, I hope you're all safe. I hope you're all healthy. And we'll see you next week. God bless.